As a person with a very deep voice, I'm hired all the time for advertising campaigns. But a deep voice doesn't sell B2B. And advertising on the wrong platform doesn't sell B2B either. That's why if you're a B2B marketer, you should use LinkedIn ads. LinkedIn has the targeting capabilities to help you reach the world's largest professional audience. That's right, over 70 million decision makers all in one place. All the big wigs, then medium wigs. Also small wigs who are on the path to becoming big wigs. Okay, that's enough about wigs. LinkedIn ads allows you to focus on getting your B2B message to the right people. So, does that mean you should use ads on LinkedIn instead of hiring me, the man with the deepest voice in the world? Yes. Yes, it does. Get started today and see why LinkedIn is the place to be to be. We'll even give you a $100 credit on your next campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash results to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash results. Terms and conditions apply. So you're earning a few extra bucks driving for a rideshare company and it occurs to you, maybe crime does pay. In today's episode, we unravel how online criminals target gig workers. Just when you thought it was safe to go online. Welcome to What the Hack, a show about hackers, scammers, and the people they go after. I'm Adam Levin. I'm Bo Friedlander. And I'm Travis Taylor. Mark, thanks for coming on the show today. Where are you coming to us from? Hello, gentlemen. Hello, Adam. It's great to be here. I'm coming from San Diego, California today. And what do you do there in San Diego, Mark? I am currently an Uber driver. I have a few different jobs, actually, but um, one of my full-time jobs is is driving for Uber. Oh, but we like to know all of them. So all of my jobs. What's your thing? What's your thing? What, what is your thing? Like, you, wake, you, you woke up when you were 18 years old and you were like, I am going to be Top Gun. No, what, what is your, what is your uh, gig? Yeah, my, my, I guess my main gig is I, um, I'm an RN and a software engineer, and I worked for um, a company called Illumina for about six years. Illumina, I know who they are. They help power a lot of really cool things, including the company that tracks your ancestors, you know, 23andMe. Wait, wait, Mark, you helped catch the Golden State Killer. That's quite a jump there, Bo. For listeners not quite following, you're not alone. Bo's talking about the DNA hit that the police were able to get off a relative to the Golden State Killer. Yep. I'm the guy that kind of put a lot of together from the backbone for a long time. That's amazing. I'm sure Travis is, is itching to ask questions about this part of the, your, your career because he's super interested in the tech side. Yeah, I think uh, overall, what uh, did you have any uh, like privacy questions about that? Uh, oh, Travis, around. You're, you're, you're shocking me and Adam. You really are worried about privacy? Yeah, when it comes to, uh, you know, genetic uh, information, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I know you are. Yeah, I mean, I know that they uh, got the Golden State Killer on a um, on the genetic information of a cousin or some, a second cousin or something like that, which on one hand, it was like, oh, I'm glad they caught the guy. But at the same time, that's kind of creepy, you know. Absolutely. And one of the problems is for a long time, this lady who was doing all this investigation, she was able to access so many different genomes that were just out there and people were, she kind of had free reign to access anybody's information that was on the site that had let it be public and so forth. But now uh, there's been some lash back and so they've limited what's available to her. And so now there's, it's an opt-in only system. I guess some people reached out and said, I, you know, I like that you caught that killer, but I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be used along this process. I don't want my information being used for this purpose. Yeah, I think the main takeaway just keeps on being, I'm glad you caught that killer, but dot, dot, dot. Okay, Travis, but we know it's really because you feel like you're going to get caught now if you steal bubble gum or something like that. Oh, I just drop other people's DNA all over the place. You know. Wow, you're a you're diabolical man. So these days you're driving for Uber Eats. What's that like? Yes, sir. Uh, I've been doing it for just under a year and it is, I enjoy it. There are definitely moments of frustration, right? As you can imagine, just, just your typical delivery driving. But the one perk of Uber Eats is there's a lot of variety to it, right? It can be all call deliveries. It can be grocery store shopping. It can be food deliveries. It can be package deliveries now and transport. So there's a lot of variety. I enjoy just gets you out, out doing something and making a little money at the same time. What are the hours that you're working for Uber? Is that like a, just a nighttime thing or is it during the day? 
Great question. So a couple of great things about the Uber job is it, it is a gig job. It's the power to just be totally flexible with your time, which I love. So you could work nights if you wanted to. You can work mornings. You can work midday. Whenever you've got a free moment, you can turn it on, turn it off. When it slows down, I'll often just pop into the gym for a minute and work out and leave it on. And now maybe I'll pick up another order. So it's just very, very flexible. However, depending on where you live sort of affects your hours that make sense to drive, right? So um, I don't live directly downtown. So where I am, it kind of follows certain, you know, the lunch and dinner type hours. By 10 o'clock, most of the restaurants near me are closed. So things really come to a, you know, slow down quite a bit by 10 o'clock. The only thing after that is pretty much fast food, 7-Eleven. Um, you know, there's, you know, GoPuff is like a 24 or late night grocery option. So those sorts of things. But so, I, you know, the money and the busyness tend to be around dinner time. Um, afternoons can work, particularly on weekends. But it just you kind of just trying to start to figure out the patterns of where you could get the biggest bang for your buck, essentially. So how many hours would you say you work? Between the two jobs. So between, you know, because it sounds like you do a lot, a lot of stuff. So, Yeah, uh, I'd say 70 to 80 hours a week. When do you sleep? <laughs> well, it's, I mean, it's just, it's rather than that or I'm going to watch some TV or something. I mean, it's not, it's, I'm basically listening to all these podcasts, right? Which is great. And you get to know the roads where you live like nobody else. You go to an area you don't even necessarily know and you'll learn a lot about that area very quickly because... Um, people are going to direct you where they want, you know, what food they want to order, where the restaurants are that they like, you know, the neighborhoods that you're going to go into. Where I live, there's very expensive neighborhoods, right? Which is kind of interesting to see. You get to drive back into these wildly expensive houses and things like that and see these neighborhoods that you would otherwise probably never see. Um, you get to go, you know, you find, yeah, all kinds of strange, you know, restaurants, stores, neighborhoods that you would otherwise not find. Mark, what's the strangest thing you've ever delivered for Uber Eats? Um, I... This happened to the second time um, this last week was a, a vibrator. I picked up a couple of the, I've had orders from CBS and this last one was from Walgreens, but they didn't have it. But uh, I've had two of those. So now, unless I'm mistaken, that means Uber Eats is not just delivering edible items. <laughs> um, no. It, uh, yeah, we do. You know, there's a shop and pay component to it. So if you want to order something from CBS or, you know, 7-Eleven, sometimes it's the driver that does the shopping. Sometimes it's done for you. You just pick it up. It's so like 7-Eleven. They'll do the shopping. You just pick it up. What else? The, what, one thing that makes it unusual to get fairly often is these really bizarre, and I don't really understand why they, it happens this way, but long, really long distance drives for something very simple. Like I think my very first drive was to pick up a sandwich and drive it like 20 something miles to someone's house. That's another thing about it, right? You don't have to be, you don't have to be in the area that you're ordering from. I can, I can order a pizza for a buddy in Tennessee and you know, have it delivered through the app mm -hmm. on my side. So that also kind of ties into the fraud aspect of this, right? Is you can, you know, you cannot be where you are or who you are, you know, when you order things, it, it's really just could be anywhere. So I know we're going to talk about something that happened to you recently, but what's the craziest thing that ever happened to you? One of them is just my imagination a little bit. And I was just, I showed up at a house, it's dark down this cul-de-sac, get down there. And the whole house just looked, looked like a kind of a kill room, right? They were painting it, right? But the whole thing, the lights are out. I don't know which door is there. There's nobody around and everything's covered in plastic. Ooh. And I'm like, Whoa. what is happening right now? Like, it, no, you know, just, were in the, and you were in the room, you walked into the situation? Yeah, I was like, I parked my car in front of the place. I'm looking for the door and I'm just out there trying to find somebody or the right address. And it's just uh, dark and, and the doors are open and everything's covered in plastic. And I'm like, what is happening right now? Feels like it's a plot from a Dexter show. Right, totally. That's what I was thinking. And the lady came out. She was very friendly, and she just apologized because she think she was in the back room or something. Didn't hear me at first, and eventually came out and, and took the food and, and just said, "Yeah, we're just you know in the middle of doing a renovation." So it was not like as you drove away, you didn't see someone running after your car. No, for help. No, nope. good. Yeah. Um, well, here's one. Um, there was a guy. This was around I think a holiday like. Was it? it? Might have been Father's Day was one of my biggest all-call delivery days, which was kind of interesting. Um, but it might have been that day or one of the big holiday days. And this guy on a narrow, windy road near my house is coming back up here, and he is just really drunk and just basically jumps out in front of my car. And so that was like he it almost seemed like he almost wanted to get hit, but he was definitely trying to fight me, right? He was trying to like hit my car, screaming at me. Um, wow. I think later he got, you know, I was like, do I call this into the police or the medics? I probably should have. I don't know. And then a little bit later, I looked on my, uh, I pulled point this app that tells you where the ambulances are going, the fire department, and they did go to that area. So I think uh, somebody probably called it in. 
or something happened. I don't know. Hey, Travis, you keep talking about Backblaze. What is it? It's a backup service, but it's an industry leader in it. It's cheap. It's only seven bucks a month, and it gives you unlimited computer backup for anything involving Macs, PCs, your business. It does it all. Wait, Backblaze? Backblaze. What would I use it for? It can really easily protect your business data as well as your personal files, and it does it through this centrally managed administrative interface. Does that mean you can access it anywhere in the world? Anywhere using their web app, and uh, you can also access your backed up files through iOS and Android, so it's a very complete service. What happens if your internet connection is too slow for a web download? You can have a hard drive sent to you, and if you return it within 30 days, you can get a full refund. Adam, you are super worried about access accidentally deleting files then for two dollars a month is that right that doesn't seem like it's right you can increase your retention history to one year that's bonkers right they've restored over 55 billion with a b uh, files for customers yeah what is this free fully featured no credit card required trial travis wh- what is the website it's backblaze.com slash hack and that's for us at what the heck if you own a business, click on business backup in the navigation and start backing up your business data. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not the only one who's a total fanboy for this. Uh, the New York Times recommended it, Inc., Macworld, PC World, LifeWire, Wired, really all the major technology review websites and publications out there are all pretty much in agreement that it is a really solid service at a great price point. Receive a fully featured 15-day, no credit card required free trial. Visit backblaze.com backslash hack and they'll know you came from what the heck I'm guessing and that will help you continue to support this show which we know you love start protecting yourself from potential bad times start today seven dollars a month no gimmicks no add-ons or gotchas that's pretty cool for a 15 day no credit card required free trial sign up at backblaze.com slash hack that's backblaze.com slash h-a-c-k As a person with a very deep voice, I'm hired all the time for advertising campaigns. But a deep voice doesn't sell B2B. And advertising on the wrong platform doesn't sell B2B either. That's why if you're a B2B marketer, you should use LinkedIn ads. LinkedIn has the targeting capabilities to help you reach the world's largest professional audience. That's right. Over 70 million decision makers all in one place. All the big wigs, then medium wigs. Also small wigs who are on the path to becoming big wigs. Okay, that's enough about Wix. LinkedIn ads allows you to focus on getting your B2B message to the right people. So, does that mean you should use ads on LinkedIn instead of hiring me, the man with the deepest voice in the world? Yes. Yes, it does. Get started today and see why LinkedIn is the place to be to be. We'll even give you a $100 credit on your next campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash results to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash results. Terms and conditions apply. Today we're going to talk about a crime, but a different kind of crime. What brought you to us? Well, technically what brought me to you was the t-shirt offer, but <laughs> <laughs> I also happened to make a note in my, in my communication to you about an event that had happened to me driving for Uber where um, you know, it was a fraud type scheme. So it sort of started with me taking a McDonald's order. I come out to my car, I get ready to go. I'm at my house. Within about two minutes, I receive a phone call from the, what, you know, I don't know who it is because the number's anonymized. I, I don't know if the number comes in. And it, it is Uber support. And, and they're telling me that there's a problem with the order. In their words, the order is broken. And that they would they mind helping them to cancel that order on my side because that they need it for whatever reason, be canceled on my on my side of the application and they'll, they'll hold. And, and in the time, just to make sure it's me, they're going to verify a few pieces of information from me. They read me my name, information that any customer really would have, that Uber Support certainly would have. And they just go ahead and, and ask me a few more questions, like how many trips have you done? Uh, how much money is in your account? Um, what's your phone number, right? Uh, phone number being key for them. So... Um, and that's a little strange, right? Because they're calling me and I think they have my phone number. Right? You called me. So you're doing the process as usual and someone reached out to say they were a member of a fraud department. I get this call about three minutes into this order. I get in my car. I'm turning everything on, getting buckled up, getting ready to go. And I get this call right away. It's, and, and so I answer the phone. So when an order goes through to a driver, 
the, the, as soon as that driver accepts, the person that placed the order sees the driver, right? They see who picked it up and they can see your rating. They can see your, probably your first name and last initial. I can see their first name, last initial. I can see where the order's going. So we know a little bit about each other. Mm -hmm. At that point, there's also the ability for that customer to make a call to the driver or vice versa. And fully anonymized too. And that's what I didn't know. And that's the first key, right? Is that the systems in place, probably using IP phone numbers or something, swap the numbers so that whether I'm texting them, they're texting me or calling, I'm calling them, the numbers are replaced with fake numbers. So I don't, you know, we're not actually getting to those numbers, but I don't know that at this point. So I pick up the phone, you know, normally I don't answer my phone a lot either, you know, right? Because most of us probably don't these days, but I pick it up and because I just assumed that right after that order, it's probably going to be the customer, right? Because I just got this order. The time use is too close. Gotcha. So I pick it up. I'm like, okay, it's going to have some comment or complaint. And I'm trying to be a good driver and, you know, be you know, addressing all these things at this point. Nowadays, I really don't answer my phone at all for customers in that way, just because it's, it, it almost never ends up well. So he calls up and says, this is Uber support. This is, I can't remember the name. This is Chris from Uber support. And I wanted to call you. And let you know that first up, he wants to identify me. It's like, is this so-and-so? This is Mark. Um, you got the order. I see that you're on McDonald's order right now. I see that you're picking this up. And I just wanted to let you know that there's a problem with the order, um, that the restaurant is telling us that the order is broken. I remember that was his words, right? He used the word broken, but it didn't, it doesn't make any sense, mm -hmm. right? It's sort of, a, I think, a mistake on his part. So, so he said, Mark, I want you to know that uh, I, I see that you're going to this McDonald's pickup and the Big Mac has a chip on it. So we're going to return it. It's broken. We're going to get a right. different Big Mac. That's so stupid. Well, so his, yeah, so his logic is, I need <laughs> you to cancel the order. Okay, okay, okay. So the guy says your order is broken. Right, because we're having some trouble. You can say it however you want. You can say the restaurant's having trouble I just canceling think it's it. It's broken. Yeah, yeah. yeah I was about to say, does did the guy sound like a, a native English speaker? Or? Yeah, actually, that's the reverse of what you might think, right? This guy actually sounded right. like he was a, just like you or me, right? Uh, I felt like he was reading something, right? Like he, which maybe he was. I don't know. Like if that was what the maybe the customer reported it electronically in that in those words. I yeah. didn't really know what that meant, but I like didn't bother questioning him. Like oh, whatever, I'll cancel it. You know, at this point, I'm thinking in my head, this is a weird call, but I'm already you know going down this track of. You know, as things are happening, what what does it matter to me? This is a five dollar order to me, probably. If I'm going to cancel it, you no, know, I haven't even left my house yet, so no big deal. I'll cancel it. He's like, can you just go into your app right now and just do that while you're there? You got your app in front of you. Go ahead and cancel it, right? So he stays on the phone, has me cancel it. That's kind of important because he wants to make sure that that's done. Because as soon as that's done, his connection and the history, by the way, of this whole thing is gone, right? It's not. It tracks in my app the history of all completed orders. But if I didn't complete it, it was canceled. I don't think that ever shows up. Like, there's no way to go back to that and say, that was the phone number or that was the time or that was the customer or anything. It's just gone. So does the cancellation rate matter? It, it does, but certain cancellations are okay and certain ones are not. If you have a lot of cancellations, you don't, um, you're not eligible for certain Uber perks which they offer through the app. Now, I, as I understand it, whoever was calling you understood how Uber worked well enough. They had been an Uber driver because they understood the perk part of it, where your cancellation rate matters. As we go through this, you're gonna see that they knew all the ins and outs of this thing. It's very dialed into exactly how the process works. What I don't understand is if this is a scam, he could let the order go through. One thing we know is probably the destination was fake, right? It's not, unless he's sending it to his buddy's house, he's not gonna, probably send it to his own house. Whoever it's going is either, it's probably a fake location. So whether the order actually goes through or not, probably doesn't make much difference. So what happened next? I cancel his order and then he's going for the next most important thing, right? I know you've heard you guys mention on this show, a lot of a lot of apps today and websites and things are based on phone numbers and two-factor verification, right? Those are the kind of the gold standard of security in a lot of things, right? Right, right. But again, I'm not thinking in those terms and so he's calling me. So he asks me, it's like, hey, thank you so much for helping me out with this cancellation of this order. Can I just verify a few things about you, right? So the verification. Can you tell me what your phone number is? Already very strange because you just called me at my phone number, right? Yeah. But I'm like, well, you, I mean, only two people in the world could kind of know about the details of this order that you just told me about, either the customer or Uber support. So I'm like, oh, this is weird. Why would a customer, 
what are they doing? I don't know. Whoever this is, I thought, I didn't know that it's scrambled numbers. So I thought you already have my number. There's no harm in giving you my number, give him my number. At this point, he could have done another trick, which I don't know if he did or not. So support would have your phone number though. So he's verifying your phone number. Someone asks you for your phone number uh, and they've called you. What's your first thought? My first thought is there's got to be more than one person doing this. And person A knows what the number is. Person B doesn't. Yeah, I mean, the number of times if I'm dealing with uh, tech support, the call can get forwarded and it could get bounced from one person to another. So you guys are like thinking this is similar to like when your doctor calls and asks you for your birth date. Right. Or that the call didn't originate with the person on the phone. It could just be a situation where a phone number is needed to identify an account. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So listen, they know the answer. They don't know the answer. Whatever it is, it might allow them to do business with you. It's a form of authentication. It's like a boiler room. Okay. They have a boiler room operation going on and, and one person is sending stuff. And there's another person who is actually trying to do more than just engaging someone on the periphery. Yeah. It's like there's the opener and then there's the closer. So the opener is the one that send the order. Yeah. But the closer is the one that's trying to now use the benefit of the potential trust that this driver has that a legitimate person made an order. And they're trying to get information out of the drive. You, you could very easily imagine a situation where there's an automatic dialer kicking live rings to different operators. Right. Ring, and I mean ring, not syndicate. So, yeah, and it doesn't need to be that sinister either. I mean, again, I've had to spend a lot of time on the phone with tech support in the past. And one thing is that you get one person saying, can you please uh, verify the account number? And then you get bounced to to the next person, they will ask you the same question, and then the same question, and then the same question. The thing that's a red flag is if someone calls you and asks for you to verify something, that's usually uh, the sign of a scam. No, but because like when I get a call from my doctor's office saying, are you coming on, you know, Tuesday for this or that? And I go, yeah, they're like, oh, great. Well, I just need to verify a few things. You know, what's your, your name, date of birth? And um, it, are you still insured by you know, X, Y, Z, they do all that. I don't think if they called you, they'd be asking for your phone number, but who knows, as you guys were saying. Right, right. But then you have this anonymizer, which you're not thinking of because you're getting this phone call and you're, you know, you're new to the app and they're like, what's your phone number? You comply. Why do you think they wanted your real phone number, Mark? Oh, we're going to get to that. I know exactly why they wanted it. So you're on the phone with supposed Uber support. They had you cancel a seemingly normal order, and now they're asking you to verify your you. Why do you think they were asking for your phone number specifically? Okay. Um, so at this point, if this is a scam, you could try to figure that two-factor thing in there and try to actually access my account right away. But what, what happens next is he then says, thank you for your number. That looks good. And just verify some other random facts. How many, how many deliveries have you done? You know how much money is in your account right now? Can you just tell me that, right? Which is very red flaggy. But I'm like, well, if you're support, you know what it is. If you're not, why does this matter? So I'm like, well, it's roughly this much money is in there. We got to be hundred dollars or something. I'm like, okay. And if he had done the two factor thing, this might have it had me verify, which I can't remember if he did or not. But if he did do that, that's all you need. I'd, he'd be into my actual account. He could pull up more details about me and then pretend even more that he's support, right? So it could be a more convincing scam if you did that. However, that would trigger. That message to me with the two factors saying don't give this number out which may or may not convince a driver to give that number out but at this point he's got my number that's all he really needs at this point and he, so the last piece of this equation is he says hey thank you so much for helping us here at support with that cancellation today i see that you're a great driver blah 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 something like that uh is it okay if we're offering gift cards this month for some of our best drivers something like that can i call you at a later time today to give you the, a gift card we have $25 gift cards here. Um, if you're okay with it, uh, I'll just have to call you back a little bit later and give you that information. And and that's it. Beware of people bearing gift cards. That should be your next t-shirt, Adam. <laughs> Very bizarre, but I'm I'm intrigued, right? But I'm like, oh, I'll take $25. You're going to give me a $25 gift card. But I'm like, how can this go sideways? I'm still trying to figure this out. What is this all about? 
I didn't give you my password. I didn't give you really any personal information per se. But you did tell them, yes, you gave them personal information. You told them how much money you had in your in your account. Yeah. That's personal information. And you had $800. I'm just curious, why were you not emptying it out? Because you certainly didn't make 800 bucks in a night. Um, it pays out automatically once a week, which is another part of the scam we're going to get to. You can download at the end of every night. You can. It charges you 85 cents, though, each time. So you were going to wait until the end of the pay period yeah. to grab I'm it. Yeah. I'm in no hurry, so I'll just let it roll to the end of the pay period and I'll automatically send it to my bank account. So as all of this is going on, I mean, is are you starting to feel like there's something wrong here that this is a scam? Or I am. Were you still... Did it, well, did it seem believable? Is, is, I'm kind of right in the middle, right? Because on the one hand, how are you getting this information? How are you scamming the system right now? I don't understand how you were able to get as far as you are, um, unless you actually are Uber support. So it, it, this whole thing seems weird and kind of shady, but maybe you're, there are problems that Uber has all kinds of problems with their process and their application. So, you know, it's kind of fraught with problems anyway. So I'm like, maybe this is just more weirdness going on at their site. Uh, it does seem a little bit scammy for sure, but I'm like, but I'm just trying to identify where the scam's coming from. Where is it going? So I'm like, I don't know. So far, I see no harm in it. Let's go a little further, you know, kind of a thing. Okay. Yeah. So we went a little further and and what did we find? So all drivers everywhere, and I think this is a problem for Uber. I don't know why they don't randomize this to make it a little harder, but payouts go out for everybody at midnight every Sunday. So for that week's pay. In addition to that, in the state of California, we have something called Prop 22 supplement money which means that every two weeks they, they recalculate your driving time and fares and all that. And if it comes up under a certain amount, you know, it's a little bit above minimum wage plus the mileage. If it comes up under that, they supplement out the difference, right? Which to mm-hmm. me ends up being about $200 a week. So that happens every other week. So there's two fatter paychecks in the month on every other Sunday, right? So, and this happened to be that week. So whether he got lucky or he knew that, he probably knew it. So he's going for a Sunday of the fatter paycheck week. Again, you've never been offered a gift card for anything before from Uber, correct? No. But it's not unlike them to call you with problems, right? They do actually call people. And do they specify what gift card it was? Or like, was it no. Amazon or just a cash card? Or No, I assumed cash card. Yeah. Okay. So he role plays pretty good. He's got the scripted out. He sounds very professional on the phone, and very convincing. Um, I get this call around midnight. Now, at first, I'm like, that's completely weird. Why are they calling me back? So a couple of things, right? Normally, tech support, I understand oftentimes they work internationally. Their hours could be weird. Uh, maybe they lost track. That, that's what I'm thinking, right? Maybe here in California, they think it's a different time. They're not really paying attention. They're just calling me because they're doing their tasks. Is this midnight yeah. on the Sunday with the uh, fatter paycheck? Yes. Yes. You're getting it. So we're getting real close to that pay time, right? Down to the minutes. So um, I'm not putting any of this together in my head. I'm just like, I don't know. He just woke me up. Uh, there's like clause expecting the guy, same guy, same voice, calls me back. At this point, I expect he's using a burner phone or something. This reminds me of the front desk scam where you check into a hotel. It's late at night. You're in bed. The phone rings. You answer it. And someone says, uh, I'm downstairs at the front desk. There's been a problem with your credit card. Either we entered it wrong or your credit card has denied the charge can you give us a new credit card or can you read back to us the original credit card you gave so we can make sure that you gave us the right number yeah and they're just hoping that you're groggy what happened to you so he's going to want to insert a gift card into my account right so in order for him to do that he calls me back he says yeah this is so and so again i've got your gift card which so he wants me to enter the card info into my account right so after I entered the gift card or prepaid card that the Uber representative was offering me over the phone, um, and I took a picture of myself to authenticate that card, which, uh, you know, in my understanding from what he was telling me was I, was I was resetting my account, not authenticating the card. So at that point, the money is, you know, he says, thank you, hangs up. I noticed the money is, uh, my account has been drained to zero. Um, and that's, and I have a weird feeling in my, in my gut that, you know, his abrupt hang up at that point is just seemed unprofessional, a little weird. After all, especially these kind of chatty before you know, I begin thinking about this and starting to call support and look into the details of my account and so forth. But it's a little confusing because it's midnight on a Sunday. So the money would have been transferred anyway. So I'm not really sure what happened. 
um, but immediately right. changed my password on my account and removed that card. So he used the gift card as a way to get in, but in reality, he was transferring your money onto that card. So, so here's another kind of problem or issue, I think, with Uber is you can either start an account using a, like a Visa gift card as currency, and that's just fine. And you can also use that as instant pay as a debit card. So in this case, that's exactly what he was doing. If you look on the website where you would enter your card to do it, it, the button you have to click on to do that says cash out. And that would be a red flag, right? Pretty much. If you were to go through the web, log in and do it, it kind of tells you right there, cash out. Like, why would I do that? But in the app, the wording says linked payment methods. Well, that's a little confusing. That could be gift cards, right? That could be a, you know, I don't know that we can add you know, money through a gift card to my Uber account, but that seems like so what we're doing. In theory, you could pay the amount of money, whatever amount you have in your account on the Uber app into a gift card, a prepaid yes. card. Yep. But I just figured out like yesterday, he doesn't have to do anything. He's done because it's almost midnight. So here's the last thing that Uber kind of messes up. That new card, when you put it in there, automatically makes it the default. And it stays the default payout method. So it switched from my bank account to his card the minute I entered his card and authorized it. So now all I have to do is wait till the clock runs down, right? I get all that and then bingo, he has your money in his card and he's out. He takes the money off the card, transfers it to whatever, yep. wherever he wants. A yep. couple things, that money can be clawed back because it can be traced. There, I would think if, so. Well, but how? It, it's, a, it's a gift card, right? Nobody's like, If he it. turned it into cash, the only way it wouldn't be traceable is if he turned it into cash. Even assuming though you got someone interested in the case, there's always the possibility that they end up going after a mule. Yeah. And the mule, Adam, just so people understand, do, do they know they're doing a crime? 99% uh, of the time, no. So it's just, it's another scam on top of the scam. Okay, back up though. I'm hearing you say that the scammer had access to your account. I don't think there's any reason why he would need to have access that's what I'm to saying, yeah that's why that's what i'm saying my original assumption was incorrect that so i was going down the road of, of how did he get access and i'm like wait a minute he doesn't need access no he just needs to trick you into linking his yeah. credit card to your account and the other thing that, that I realized was by doing it at midnight when it pays out the other benefit he gets from that is that that money just vanishes to the card it doesn't tell you where it was transferred or whatever you, you know, kind of put that together yourself but you don't see that money like it takes two days right because it wouldn't hit my bank account until tuesday so hmm. it's just lost into the netherworld until for two days. And so I don't really know that I've been scammed for sure because the money would have disappeared anyway. And did Uber do anything to help you recoup the cost? Or No, nope. I tried all kinds of conversations with calls for the next hour or two that night, I think even and some more the following days, you know, going through the different appeals process and they'll, they'll take it, they'll answer your call, they'll file it and they'll move it up, um, you know, to their security teams, they call it. But at the end of the day, it's good. They send you back, but you know, a, a blank form response saying um sorry that happened to you you know take better precautions i don't know i have it here but um you know they're not, they're not really helpful at all they're gonna say they're gonna say sorry that some you know criminal talked to you into giving them your money right well the important thing is to be awake be alert and know what's going on and anytime there's the slightest hint that something isn't right is you got to cut it off right then and there, and you got to call the proper authorities. In this case, was communicating with Uber. I think it, it, for me, it has to be a, and uh, there has to be a system of on-off switches that you know, almost like programming, Mark, where you know, red light, green light, traffic is going this way, it's not going that way, and when it comes to money leaving your account, it's always going to have to leave the same way. But there's always going to be a scammer who says something that doesn't quite make sense, but sort of makes sense. And there, you have something called linked accounts, which is a flaw in the architecture of the app you're using. In other words, when I say flaw, Uber, just bear in mind, all I'm saying is it could be clearer. Absolutely. It's not clear what's happening when it's happening. And also the fact that as a driver, you don't know these, if you don't aren't aware of these processes, like the automatic payout, the fact that it, you know, all you need for somebody to log, log into your account, you know, potentially is just your phone number and getting like, those two-factor numbers, you know, or um, there's just so many little nuances to this scam that if you're not aware that that's what's happening, the timing of it, the, the putting in, you don't, don't put a card in for anybody. There's no such thing as, you know, the gift carding situations. But if you don't know these things, right, it seems plausible. Shouldn't Uber be red flagging this? Absolutely. 
I mean, the, the, you know, the confirmation theater here needs to be pretty clear, and it was not. I mean, I think the uh, elephant in the room here, too, is that this happened October of last year, and in September, uh, Uber was breached, and the data of 77,000 Uber drivers was compromised. So at a minimum, that means um, even if they got you to give them that information, um, it still put a target on every single Uber driver's back, or at least 77,000 of them. And that was not the first breach. Uber's had a number of them, one particularly high profile where uh, one of the senior officials in Uber is now facing time, I think. Yeah, there was their uh, CSO, yep, for uh, obstruction of justice for trying to cover up the data breach. Wow. I mean, I think the I think one of the biggest uh, takeaways here is that the idea of a gig economy is very much that if it's a customer, that's one thing. But if you are the person doing the gig, you're more or less on your own, which sort of seems to be the message that uh, Uber has sent to their drivers. If you've been targeted by a scam, that's a you problem, not a Uber problem. But there have been several cases of this uh, nationwide, unfortunately. At the same point, it would seem to me that it is in Uber's best interest to better protect their drivers because you guys are the lifeblood for the company. I think I stopped driving for three or four weeks. Mm -hmm. I was just like, I don't know, this isn't worth it. Like, I don't know how, you know, the system seems crazy. I don't know what's happening right now. Um, you know, so, but there's another service I drive for called Roadie and they do an authentication with an actual driver's license, which I think is interesting because for alcohol deliveries or for CBD deliveries or for certain medication deliveries, you know, I take the person's, I take your driver's license and I scan your barcode on the back of your ID, right? Uh -huh. And that's something I can't necessarily reproduce online. I mean, that's, I mean, that's an authentication from an actual physical thing. And that's what Rody does, right? So they'll authenticate you by right. having you scan the back of your driver's license. So, Bo and Adam, you guys know I'm a bit of a uh, privacy geek, if you will. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you are. Yeah, totally. I, I really just don't like the idea that just about anyone can find you online, can find out where you live or your email address, or your phone number or anything. I just think that entire idea is super creepy. There's so much of my data already out there, but is there something that you can do? Yeah, actually, you can use Delete Me. Delete Me is a service that pretty much does the heavy lifting for you, where they go to all the data brokers that they have on file and uh, just pull your data and delete it on a regular basis. I use it. I like it. And they make it quick, easy, and safe to remove your personal data online. Well, yeah, with these data brokers, they can accumulate huge amounts of your personally identifiable information. And if all that information gets into the hands of a bad actor, that opens you up to a lot of risk. And if you act now, you can get 20% off your Delete Me plan when you go to joindeleteme.com slash WTH and use promo code WTH. The only way to get 20% off is to go to join deleteme.com slash WTH and enter promo code WTH at checkout. That's join deleteme.com slash WTH promo code WTH, which stands for what the hack. And we thank you for supporting delete me and what the hack. Lauren. Mike. So we host a podcast for Wired called Gadget Lab. We do. We do. <laughs> yes, that is correct. <laughs> Tell the good people some more about it. Well, I think the good people should definitely tune in every week because they get to hear me roasting you. Hey, no. All right. No, really, what Gadget Lab is, is Mike and I tackling the biggest questions in the world of technology. I like to think of it as the best of Wired's journalism, but in audio form. We cover the big news of the week in tech land, but we also offer our expert analyses and opinions on all things consumer tech, whether that's mobile apps, hardware, startups, cryptocurrency. Mike, what's been a recent highlight episode for you? We did a deep dive on the group behind the massive Okta hack. We mm -hmm. also had a great conversation about Web3 and the metaverse. What stands out for you? Never metaverse you didn't like. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed our recent podcast about Peloton. Um, and recently, the legendary tech journalist Kara Swisher joined us to talk all about Elon Musk and the future of Twitter. So I guess we should tell people how they can listen to our pod. We release a new episode of Gadget Lab every week, and you can listen and follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you pod. After all this, do you have advice or tips for gig drivers, for consumers? Well, I sort of somewhat jokingly say don't ever answer your phone, right? That avoids the entire problem altogether. Just don't take customer calls, period. Um, but... 
I would say if somebody calls you and they say their support um, right away, it's very unlikely. And you can always do the thing that you always say, which I think is the best defense ever, is hang up and call support. Mm-hmm. Right? Call real support. Because then that's a verification right there for sure. Right? And that avoids any possible scams. You do that with the, almost all these scams, right? It's just get just say, okay, thank you for the information. Let me call myself to the actual source and verify. Well, I think the thing to keep in mind too is that um Anytime I ever try to contact tech support, it takes a huge amount of time and a huge amount of effort. And so the idea of, of uh, tech support contacting you is uh, in and of itself something that's uh, suspicious. So after you got scammed, you did research. My initial thing I found was that people were uh, talking about this. Uh, I'm sure you can find a lot of things about that on Reddit or different places. But the one thing I did find is that people were saying they were getting reimbursed. So that gave me hope that maybe I would be reimbursed. But, and I mentioned it to Uber and so forth in my filings with them. Um, didn't happen. Uh, I don't know that I read a whole lot more online to see what other people were saying about it. I, it doesn't seem like it's very difficult to create a fake Uber account uh, because there's three things they need. And two of them I already know how to fake, right? Pretty easily. And the third one seems not too hard. One, all they want is email and verification. I found multiple websites that allow you to, they call them disposable email services. Right, like tempmail.org, gorilla.mail, so forth, where you don't even need to create an account. You just go in there. Um, they have a general email address for you. Type that into whatever the service is, and it'll receive whatever the response back is. So you can grab that verification code. And you never even created the email account, so it's not even assigned to you, right? Right. What else? That, uh, then, then payment method, right? They allow, as I talked about earlier, they allow you to put in a gift card for your payment methods. That's anonymous, right? You can just buy one of those anywhere for the cash. Correct. And then last thing is the phone. So if you could just figure out how to use a second number burner phone that can somehow link to the app, then that's the only other thing they have for security. So you need to receive SMS and work phone calls through a fake phone and you're otherwise you're good to go. Yeah, I think that people are setting up a lot of fake Uber accounts on the customer side for a variety of reasons. And they're doing exactly what you say. They just use, you know, Google Voice, Google Mail. Uh, thank you, Google, Google, Google. But there are other services to be fair to Google. And I just don't, you know, there's a, there's a whole constellation of crimes that can be committed. And that's one of the reasons I listen to you guys as well as the other scam podcasts, right? Is I want to try to think about these things in those ways and be informed. Well, first of all, I'm really glad that you listen to our podcast and that you get information that you can use in real life. And recently you had an opportunity to put that information to the test. Someone tried to scam you again, didn't they? First event um, when I was a real estate new driver happened on October 24th of 2022. And it's been pretty silent since then, but by sheer coincidence, about a week ago, Friday, um, the ex- it seemed like the exact same series of events happened again. And it, that order was also McDonald's. That brings to mind the old George W. Bush line about, screw me once, shame on you. Mm-hmm. Screw me twice, shame on you. Wait, I'm not going <laughs> to you. Shame on you again. <laughs> Well, Mark, we really appreciate it. We're sorry that you went through some agony on all of this, but I think your story is definitely a cautionary tale. Gig workers should be listening very carefully to this, and consumers also should be listening to understand the fact that any day, any moment, anywhere, on any subject, uh, you can become a victim. You can certainly become a target. Yep. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing business on an app, mind the gap. I like that. Oh, yeah. this is this is fun. Great meeting all of you. For the benefit of our listeners, and I think you've mentioned this before, uh, you were an Uber driver. I, you know. I stopped being an Uber driver when I'm not going to name her because, you know, rest in hell, but she ate chicken in my car and wiped her hands off on the seat and it was no longer fun. Well, also, you went to some sketchy areas that gave you pause, right? Sketchy? I was, I I get in the car and say, I was like, hey, how are you doing this evening? He was like, fine. I was like, great, where are we going? He was like, we're going to drop off some crack. Wow. Very special. <laughs> <laughs> and then I found myself in a neighborhood and I said, and it looked like the, the driveway we were going to really looked like a place where you might get killed. And I said, um, I just said, um, 
And he said, you can let me out here. <laughs> that was, yeah, I figured no, no, you're no, sitting there in the back of your head going, hey, listen, worst case, I'm an unindicted co-conspirator. No, for real. Talking about mules, I was. And I think that a lot of uh, that happened to me one other time. Quick story. I was on my way home and I thought, I'll just turn the app on and see if there's anyone here. And it was like two in the morning. And um, a background, guys, my daughter went to University of Michigan. And my my monthly nut went up considerably. I needed to make some money. I made ends meet. I stopped doing it. But so at any rate, I was I was like, I'll just pick up this one person. Gets in the car. Very clearly a Coke, a Coke dealer. Came in with a tumbler of vodka. Asked if I wanted a hit off of the tumbler of vodka. And I was just driving her down I-95 to the next exit. Driving on the way back, it was very clearly a drug deal. I was like, whatever, it was a drug deal. I'm going home now. And a spider, because you know I live in the woods, started to dangle from the rear view mirror. And as luck would have it, my Coke dealer was also an arachnophobe. <laughs> <laughs> and so she had a full psychotic break in the back of my car about the spider. Was it a really big spider? Dude. This spider made Charlotte's Web's little baby spiders look gigantic. It was barely anything. It was a little fleck of dust with legs. So a microscopic spider. It was, and her response was anything but microscopic. But the question remains, did she spill the vodka? <laughs> of course, of course not. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe a half psychotic break. Anyway, Dealing that's with a professional, my, I see. Yep. <laughs> that's that's my experience. But I was, you know, I, I, I guess it's different for Uber Eats, but this idea is, I must say, scammer gold. How do we avoid it? Because I I could see someone falling for that too. Like linked account, sure. You're gonna give me 25 bucks, great. And then they suck out all your money. First things first, always question, never trust when it comes to getting a communication. Always make sure you understand who's actually contacting you, whether it's an email, a message, or a phone call, etc. Number two, don't provide sensitive information, especially when you're contacted out of the blue by somebody claiming that they are the company you're driving for. In the middle of the night, too. So what about three? Is there a three? Strong password hygiene, which means unique strong passwords that you do not share across a universe of accounts. Uh huh. Is there a four? There is a four. Protect your personal information. It's always the simple rule of thumb. If somebody contacts you out of the blue, even if you think you know who you're talking to, never share your personal information ever. And number five, which is use official channels. So what's number six? Beware of urgent requests. So if you get an email with the subject line urgent, if you get a text saying this is urgent, or if, even if it's uh, implied, uh, scammers try to get you into a panic to make you uh, not think twice about what you're doing. And when they do that, um, you're going to make the wrong call. Anytime anybody asks you to do something immediately, stop, take a breath, think about it. And then after you've had time to reflect, if you want to answer, that's fine. But take time. Right. Well, you guys have described, first of all, Adam, if I do what you're saying and suggesting with my most prevalent scammer, the, the scammer that hits me the most in life, I'm going to have an accident, really. And if I, and if I, I have to obey the urgency. Do you know who my most prevalent scammer is? I'm ready. It's my bladder. <laughs> Yeah, I was about to say, it sounds like you're going to pee on the floor. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that with us and the thousands hey, of people. Hey, I'm old. I can't help it. Listen, you know, my my urgent calls are always from nature. And is Dark Night Diaries gone. hiring? Uh, is Dark Night Diaries? Now we've gone Bo has into fallen the donut. Him. I guess you guys probably are seeing right now that I'm wearing the new What the Hack t-shirt, the 100th episode t-shirt. It is awesome. And you might have heard Mark say that he's waiting for his. Well, he hasn't gotten it yet because Travis and I are diligently going to have to start sending those out. 
Hey, don't throw me under the bus here. Hey, no, I'm going to do, they're in my car. It's not your fault. <laughs> and if you want the t-shirt, really, all you have to do, just send us your personal information. <laughs> we need your address. We do. I mean, it's for real. We need to know what size. So if you want one, and how could you not, send an email to info at adamlevin.com. Info at adamlevin.com. And you can use the same email address to contact us if you've been hacked or scammed and uh, want to tell your story on the show. So now it's time for our tinfoil swan, our paranoid takeaway to help keep you safe online. Travis, what is it this week? Come on, what is it? Well, for a lot of folks, myself included, uh, it's back to school week. Yep, it certainly is. My kid's back in school. Adam's kid's back in school. And there's a lot of information that's flying around out there. Whether it's back to school shopping, you signing your kid up for extracurricular activities, think about it, a waterfall of information. Yep, and a lot of parents are using Schedula or Pupil Path or other things to track their children's progress in school, and that's a weekly thing. There's a lot of information flying around, and it is um, something that you need to keep track of. But one of the things that you know people don't think about is you know something really simple like the school's phone number. Yeah, so one thing I uh, never really got around to with my kids last school that I'm doing this year is just every time I see a phone number from, say, the office or the school nurse or something, I'm just entering that into my phone and saving it so I have a better sense of who it is that's actually contacting me. Well, you know, that's a really good idea. And you can also do that with teachers because it's not that uncommon for a teacher, you know, especially if your child's having an issue, uh, to call you directly and just make sure that number is in your phone. It's, it's a lot of work there, Travis, no? It is, but it pays off in the long run. So if you happen to get a phone call from someone just saying like, hey, your kid's been in an accident, if you just look down and see that that is in fact from your school, then you are, uh, at least you have a better sense that that is a legitimate issue. But you can spoof a phone number, right? Yeah, they do, but I think this might be a bridge too far for a lot of scammers. That's right. I mean, I get scam calls from my area code all the time, but someone would really need to be focused on getting me personally if they were to try to get that granular. Yeah, you mean like a nurse's office or something? It, it, listen, it's 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 sort of, I don't know, do-it-yourself, two-factor authentication. Not a silver bullet, but it does provide an extra level of protection. And that's our tinfoil swan. What the Hack with Adam Levin is a production of Loud Tree Media. You can find us online at adamlevin.com and on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Adam K. Levin.